Well, it is a month uh, since Hamas launched their attack on Israel. And today we are joined uh, by Ron Derma, the Minister for Strategic Affairs, someone who is known as Bibi's brain. He's so close uh, to the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. The Israeli Minister of Strategic Affairs sits on the five-man Israel war cam cabinet. It's the first UK inter interview with a member of that cabinet. And I'm pleased to say he joins us now on this programme. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. Good to be now, with you, Sophie. It's exactly a month since Hamas entered Israel and murdered hundreds of people, from people attending a peace festival to going house to house, murdering families and babies as well. Uh, one month on, how do you reflect on that event and the impact it's had on the people of Israel? Well, it was the worst attack against the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And, you know, for Israel, we're, we're used to wars and we're used to terror attacks over time, but we've never seen a slaughter like this, a wanton slaughter, children being killed in front of their parents, parents being killed in front of their children, uh, people being burnt alive, uh, the wanton destruction and these atrocious crimes that were committed by Hamas. And I think early on, the president of the United States said it was worse than ISIS. I think the chancellor of Germany said it was like Nazis. Uh, and I said, there's a, there's a difference. You know, the Nazis hid their crimes from the world. They tried to con the world into thinking they weren't doing what they were doing. And even Stalin hid his crimes from the world. These people were wearing GoPros. They were like Nazis with GoPros running through these towns and, vi and villages, peaceful communities, killing everything in their path and taking 200 and our 40, 240 of our uh, citizens hostage and now holding them uh, in Gaza. So it was a horrific crime and Israel, like any self-respecting nation uh, is going to respond and is going to ensure that we dismantle Hamas's military infrastructure in Gaza, that we end its political rule in Gaza, and that we ensure that Gaza no longer presents and poses a threat to the state of Israel. This round, Sophie, that we're having with Gaza, you've been following it for many years, we've had many rounds in Gaza, this round is going to be the last round. I want to talk a bit about your response in a moment, but just first, is there going to be an investigation into the complete intelligence failure uh, that missed the attacks by Hamas? For sure. Israel has a long history of investigating and getting to the bottom of all these issues. And there's going to be a lot of questions that people are going to have, rightly so. Uh, and everybody, I think, wants to get answers. And certainly the people of Israel deserve those answers. Okay. Uh, but we'll do that after the war. Right now, we're focused on prosecuting the war, winning the war. Uh, because we have no choice. We cannot allow something like this to happen uh, on our border. Uh, the people of Israel are united and determined to remove this threat. And that goes across the political spectrum uh, in Israel. And I think it's reflected in the war cabinet, where you have a broad range of opinion. But on this issue, eliminating Hamas, uh, we are united. Well, let's talk about eliminating Hamas. You say your aim is to eliminate Hamas, to destroy Hamas. So what is your estimate for the number of Hamas fighters that you've killed? Several thousand. I can't give you the specific estimate, but it's definitely north of 3,000, maybe close to 4,000 already. Um, there were also many in that initial attack that we were, that, that obviously we paid a horrific price, but we repelled and killed many of the Hamas fighters who came in. But since that time, we've killed many, many, uh, as I said, several thousands. The reason why I can't give you a specific number is that Hamas operates, as I'm sure you and your viewers know, in this underground terror tunnel network. And so when we attack those tunnels and we destroy those tunnels and those tunnels collapse, it's not clear exactly how many terrorists there are there, uh, but it's many, many, many hundreds and over thousands now since our ground operation uh, began. In fact, when our ground operation began, we've had fewer civilians who've been killed and actually many more terrorists who've been killed. Well, let's, let's talk about the civilians, shall we? Three to 4,000, you say, roughly, your estimate for Hamas operatives. I, at least. Now, the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry estimates that 10,000 civilians have been killed in Gaza since the October 7th attacks. What's your estimate for the number of civilians in Gaza who have been killed? I, I don't know uh, the actual estimate. I know that in previous rounds, we've heard that there were this or that number of civilians, and then you, when all was I'm, said I'm really, and done, how and can act, you how can you not know? You must have some kind of. Estimate. I don't know how many. I don't know how many people were killed in Gaza. I don't know how many terrorists were how killed in Gaza. Know, I just, how can you give me an estimate, a rough estimate? I, I I understand for the number of Hamas fighters, and not an estimate for the number of civilians. Is it something that you're uncomfortable with? 
No, it's not because I just don't know. Because what happens when you have military unit that's going through an area and they may find out, you know, 30 terrorists came out to attack them and those 30 terrorists were killed and that would come back to us. But exactly how many civilians, I know what the Gaza uh, health ministry, which is run by Hamas, has reported. I don't know if that's true. If it's not true, I know in past when they've tried to say how many of them are civilians and how many of them are fighters, they've said, you know, it's 80 percent or 90 percent civilians. And it turns out it's almost 50 50. So I don't know. We'll have to wait. I guess we'll uh, we'll get the facts later. But listen, every civilian Isn't who is killed get the facts uh, is a tragedy. Surely, surely you must have a better grip on the number of civilians who are losing their lives. I really Gaza. don't, Sophie. You're welcome to go and speak to the people in Gaza if you know better than I do. I mean, I'm just in Israel's I war cabinet. So what do I know? You. I can't tell you, I can't tell you the number of people. What I can tell you that every civilian who was killed in Gaza is a tragedy. And they are the unintended consequence of legitimate warfare. It happens in every war, particularly in a war where we're dealing with an enemy that uses their own civilians as human shields, as a matter of policy, that uses hospitals, schools, uh, mosques, any kind of civilian facility to ensure that they keep their civilians in harm's way. That's what they feel is their protection. And I think it's a double war crime. Not only do they target us, which they have, as you said, on that horrific day in October 7th, but since that day, they fired about 10,000 rockets at Israel. Just a, a few minutes ago, we, we had to go to a bomb shelter here in Tel Aviv because there was another rocket that was fired at Israel. So they perpetrate a double war crime. They target our civilians, and then they hide and embed themselves in civilian areas. And so it's very I... difficult for a country like Israel that does everything to get people out of harm's way to tell them, go to the south get out of the, all of those areas of conflict. And Hamas is doing everything to keep them in harm's way because they don't care at all about the civilians uh, in Gaza. And I think it's a tragedy for the Palestinians and it's also a tragedy for Israel. If you can't, um, you can't give me the number for the estimate for number of civilians who've lost their lives in Gaza. Uh, as you said, the Hamas estimate is 10,000. So say 3,000 Hamas operatives uh, losing their lives. Are you, are you comfortable with that ratio? Three I would not like, I, every, first of all, I don't even know what that means. I don't know what that means, Sophie, with a ratio. Eight million Germans died in World War II and 400,000 Americans did. I don't know how many Brits did, but that means 20 times as many Germans died as Americans. Does that mean that somehow the Nazis were right and the Americans were wrong? That has nothing to do with the laws of war and it has nothing to do with proportionality. I'm not comfortable with any civilian being killed, but I'll tell you what I'm even uh, less comfortable with that we have on our border a terror organization that seeks the destruction of Israel. And what they did on October 7th has to be answered by Israel because it's not just a threat to Israel. It is a threat to all of civilization. We cannot allow such an act of barbarism to go unanswered and we cannot give them immunity with the use of human shields because what happens is they use the human shields to try to turn public opinion against Israel because they're hoping that you're going to focus all the time on the civilians. And I don't have a problem with you focusing on the civilians because I think it's a tragedy. But the blame for that tragedy should put, be put squarely at the feet of a terror organization like Hamas. Because the question, and I'm sure you feel this, Sophie, the same way, I'm sure you feel it's immoral to use civilians as human shields, just as every decent person does. The question is, is it going to let me just finish? Let me just finish the sentence and I'll answer what you have to say. The question is not whether it's immoral. The question, is it effective? Is it an effective tactic of war? Will the international media, will politicians around the world blame Israel for these civilians so that it will encourage Hamas and other terror organizations around the world to say, you know, the focus of the international media it's not going to be on people building terror tunnels under hospitals and using people as human shields. It's going to be to blame the democratic country that is fighting a war of self-defense, the most legitimate war of self-defense, even one that unfortunately leads to civilian casualty. I am um, keen to talk about what happens after the conflict, because I understand that you are focusing now on the military and on the, uh, the war itself. But of course, if there's to be any chance of peace for the Israelis and the Palestinians, there has to be a thought of what happens when the fighting stops. Who do you see governing Gaza? Well, I think it'll be the Palestinians that are gonna govern Gaza. You know, who those Palestinians will be, I don't know. I know who they're not gonna be. It's not gonna be Hamas. We're gonna have to uh, wipe out and eliminate, as I said, not only Hamas's military infrastructure, but end their rule of Gaza. Uh, and hopefully the Palestinians eventually will be able to choose a leadership that is committed to peaceful coexistence with Israel and not one that is determined to destroy Israel. And that also teaches their children 
to live at peace with Israel and doesn't demonize Jews and demonize Israel and raise a whole generation to, with these with this wild, wild again, idea for the destruction of Israel and the murder of on Jews. The, if I may, just to focus again on, on the plans for the future, the, the, the path to peace, if you like, do you believe there should be an independent state of Palestine? The question that you have on the question of a state is, and the prime minister has said it many times, he says the Palestinians should have all the powers to govern themselves, but none of the powers that could threaten Israel. When you talk about a state, you have to deal with certain powers. Do they have an army? Do we want Palestinians to have an army that could threaten Israel? Do they control the airspace? Do they control the borders? Can they make military pacts with other countries like forgive, Iran? Forgive me, so I, 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 don't don't understand, people... I don't understand the answer, forgive me. Um, do you believe there should be an independent state of Palestine? Yeah, because, it's not, because you want a yes or no answer, but it's not a yes or no answer, because there are certain limits on sovereignty that has to be put in place, because exactly. Israel faces unique security threats that no other country faces. So when I speak to people and I say, well, you for a two-state solution, most people are. And then I ask them, wait a second, do you believe that the Palestinians should have an army? No, they don't think that. Because it's, it's think an important question because America and the UK both say they do believe in a two-state solution. Is that yeah, just but not they credible? Also, are they, are but they wrong? They, I think they also are very clear about the restrictions that have to be placed on the certain sovereign powers of the Palestinian state that they support that would not endanger Israel. And I think the formula we have to get to in substance is one that will give them all the powers that they need for self-determination to govern their own lives. Israel doesn't want to govern them, but none of the powers that can be used to threaten Israel. And that's a serious problem, and it requires a serious discussion to figure out how you achieve that outcome. Here in the UK, as in many countries around the world, thousands of people have been taken to the streets to protest on pro-Palestinian marches. You know, when you see those crowds of people in the United Kingdom, what goes through your mind? I just think it's an indictment, frankly, of a uh, higher educational system. Uh, it reminds me of the debate uh, in the Oxford Student Union in 1933 that I read about in history 10 days after Hitler came to power. Uh, and there was a resolution that was passed in the Oxford Student Union that this house uh, would not under any circumstances fight for king and country. And I think that sent a very powerful message to Hitler of what was happening in England at the time. And it was a very bad message. Churchill later wrote about it. But I think it's shameful because I don't think that those people who are protesting in the streets, they're not calling for peace. They're not asking about the intricacies of a two state solution. What they support is the destruction of the one and only Jewish state. And that's shameful. And I'm very glad that your prime minister has been very supportive of Israel from the beginning. And yes, like him, Israel wants to do everything to keep civilians out of harm's way. And we want to get humanitarian goods into there. But you have to look at this in the eye and you have to ask those protesters, do they support the existence of a Jewish state? And what you'll find is 95 percent of those people supporting the answer is no. And Israel is not going to commit suicide because you have thousands of people protesting against it uh, in England. It's not going to happen. Know. We're going to defend You're... ourselves and we're going to secure no. our future. Now, I know, of course, there'll be lots of people watching this program who disagree uh, very strongly uh, with what you say, people who have perhaps been on those protests well, again. Well, send but a thank reporter you for your... to ask them. Send a reporter to ask them. Ask them what they think about Israel. See if okay. a single one will say, yes, we got... support Israel's right to exist, because that's not what I see. That's not what I see of those people when they say, free Palestine from the river to the sea. That's a call for genocide, for polycide, the destruction of a state, and genocide against the Jewish people. We've been here before. The birth of Israel gave the Jewish people the power to fight back. That's what's changed. It hasn't ended hatred towards the Jews, but it has given us the power to fight back. When you have people going with signs that says Palestine from the river to the sea, that is incitement to genocide, which is a war crime. And it should not be tolerated, even if it goes in your higher educational systems or any other parts of Britain. It's wrong and it should be condemned forthrightly. And I think that your government, your current government is doing that. And I appreciate it. And I think the head of your Labour Party had some very strong statements also in support of Israel's right to defend to defend itself at the beginning of the war. And I appreciate it, which is a big difference from what happened with Jeremy Corbyn, who was an anti-Semite, who was the head of one of your Labour parties. And I'm glad he was spit out by the British public. OK, and I know that Jeremy Corbyn would disagree. I, it's my well, job to say... He can say disagree, but he called Hezbollah and Hamas his friends. Okay. He called the people who We're murdered 1,400 women, children and Israelis and took 240 people hostage his friends. 
They are not his, are his, they may be his friends, but they're Israel's enemies and they should be the enemies of all civ the civilized world. We're out of time. Ron Derma, strong words uh, from Ron Derma there. War crimes have been committed uh, on those marches, according to him. Thank you for being on The Politics Hub.